Look with me in Genesis 45. I'll begin with the famous verse, verse 5. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves. This is Joseph talking to his brothers. Because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve your life. Verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. One more time, he says it in verse 11. Therefore, I, Joseph, will provide for you and your household all you have come to poverty for that, lest you come to poverty, for there is still five years of famine. So there are four ways that God will provide for us, and they're found so easily in the scriptures. The first way that God provides for you, if you're taking notes, is through the hand of man. That's exactly what happened in this text. The Bible said that Joseph was talking to his brothers who had heard him. His brothers who had thrown him in a pit and stolen his birthright. And then he turns around and he says to them, you meant it for my evil. I'm not bitter. I'm not offended. I'm not angry. You meant it for my evil. But I see how God used what you put me through for my good. I wouldn't be where I am today. Well, where was he? Where was he? Let's talk about that for just one minute. He was working, the right-hand man, he was working in Egypt. He was a Jew, but he was in Egypt. And Pharaoh, at that time, history records, was the wealthiest man in the world. He owned the most real estate in the world. He had the mightiest army in the world. He was the most powerful Pharaoh on the planet. And guess what he did? He turned the keys over of his wealth to a Jew, this Egyptian Pharaoh, gave the whole kingdom and its wealth to be controlled by this boy named Joseph. And Joseph then in return says to his own brothers who had done him wrong, don't be afraid, I'm not going to hurt you now that I'm on this side of the blessing of God. The first way that God will provide is through the hands of men. That's why Luke chapter 6 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, running over. And here's the key to that verse. Shall men. Shall men. God says, I will cause men to give to you. The same God that takes three loaves and two fish and multiplies it and breaks it and says, I'll make it exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. He's your God. And the scripture said that he will use men to give unto you. They'll give you jobs. They'll open doors for you. They'll, they'll, they'll notice. They'll invest in you. He knows how to cause men to give unto you. Secondly, the second way that God provides is through the hands of God. He uses the hands of men, and then there are supernatural blessings. Let me t tell you what I mean. When Joseph took care of those families for years and years and years, they were on the blessing train and they didn't have to worry about anything. And Joseph was the source and really Pharaoh was the source. God used the hands of man to take care of them. But the Bible said, and there arose another Pharaoh after he died that knew not Joseph nor his God. And everything changed and suddenly all the resources that they had put their hope and faith in, it was taken out of their life. And I want to encourage somebody that when you lose a contract, when a big financial situation walks out of your life, it's a teaching moment that you need to learn this point. God uses man's hands, but God is real touchy about when you start looking to anybody more than him as your source. 
be thankful for where you are and begin to praise God for what he's already given you. He's got more and he'll bless you if you'll obey him and you'll honor him. I want you to put your hands together and I want you to thank the Lord for all that God's hand has provided. That old song, all that I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Look at the clothes. Look at the blessings. Look at the goodness of God. To God be the glory. Don't ever lose your humility. Don't ever lose your appreciation and thankfulness to God. He opened doors no man can shut. You found your way, and God has been good to you. Hallelujah. I'm preaching myself happy. And God gave me this when I didn't, I didn't see all the stuff that I see now. But I've seen the hand of man. I've actually had people come up to me and say, I don't know why I'm doing this here. And I could tell they didn't like me. And I just smiled and said, praise the Lord. See, to you, it's a story, but to me, it's a miracle. Even the building you're sitting in, that nice cushioned seat, it's a miracle to me. It's more than just a seat. We didn't have any of it, but it came from the hand of God. I don't know how it happened. I still, I don't know why it happened. It's nothing but the provision from the hand of God. And if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. Don't you quit dreaming. Don't you stop believing for better things. Don't you dare lay down the life and let it kick you. You get up and stand up on your hind feet and say, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches. Every one of your children will go to college if they want to. Every one of them, God will supply all that I need. The hand of God. Now somebody shout, I don't care, I don't care who came. Ooh. He'll make you the head and not the tail. He'll bless you in the city and bless you in the field. Man will try to block you out. But God says, where I bless and my hand blesses, nobody can push it down and destroy it. He'll bless by the hand of man. It's just people coming. There's a wave of the hand of man coming. And when it happens, you better give God the thanks. And then he'll bless by the hand of God, supernatural provision. I have so many stories I could talk, pause and stay. Just trust me, supernatural provision. The third thing is, this is the part that I want you to shout then because I knew you'd dry up on this one. Because we're all happy when it's the hand of man and when it's the hand of God. But the next way he'll bless you is your own hand. It's called a job. Some of you won't read the book of Job because it's spelled job. I'm scared you'll have to get one. But in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 12, it said when they crossed over Jordan, I mean all those years, the hand of God gave them manna for 40 years. The hand of God did the miracle. But then there comes a new season where God says, I don't want you living by miracles all the time. I don't want you in 911 calls, help God, help, help. We're going to lose the house. We're going to lose the car. God will give you miracles. Not, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with being, I've been there. I know what you're talking about. But, but there's nothing wrong with having needs. But there's a greater plan God has than just struggle and scratching and scraping by. And by your own hand, what do you mean? The Bible said the manna ceased and God said something to him in Deuteronomy 11 in verse 9. He said, the land that I'm taking to you to is flowing with milk and honey for the land that you possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a watered garden. You see, when they were in Egypt, the land was so dry and parched that they had to 
pipe water from the Nile River, and the only way they could do that was with foot pumps. And they had to have people out there 24 hours a day, and they would work so hard, go, go, foot pump. And the water would just, just a little bit, just a little bit, just enough, just enough to keep the crops alive. But God said, I don't want you for the rest of your life to just depend on getting by the hand of man, the hand of God, but I will bless your hand of labor. And the land that I'm taking you to, you're moving from a foot pump mentality to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I need you to believe and I need you to use the work of your own hands. You are gifted at something. God says, I will not do for you. I won't do it for you. You have to find your own gift and figure out what you're gifted. When I started out, I started out with a Bible in one hand and a saxophone in the other. That's all that I knew to do. Study this, pray fast and preach this and play this. And when I couldn't preach a good sermon, I had my saxophone on standby because I knew it could pull me out of a nosedive. Just grab it. And I promise you, just hold your hands up. May the God of heaven bless. Look at, the, look at your hands. Look at them just a minute. Keep them up. And, and I just speak this way. May the God of heaven bless the work of your hands. May it increase. May it multiply. Whatever your hand touches, may it multiply and multiply and multiply. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, salesman, shout. Come on, car dealer, shout. Come on, insurance man, shout. Come on, mechanic, shout. Come on, factory worker. Come on, single mother. Come on and say, God's going to multiply the work. I'm going to give him work, and he's going to multiply it like he did the bread. I need somebody to give him a, a shout of faith in a, in a rough economy. Interest rate higher, higher, higher. But God is saying, I am still your Jehovah Jireh, Jireh, Jireh. He's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. God wants you highly fruitful. Now, let me end with this. The last way that God blesses us, and I wrote this and I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't even know what I was talking about. It's through the hand of your enemy. Now, that's kind of how I felt, you know, when I wrote it. I thought, that's good. Because I had some, you know, I had some people who didn't like me and talked about me and all that. that. That's not an enemy. That's not, you don't understand. But there will come, the bigger your assignment, there will come true enemies that are sent to kill, steal, and destroy every way they can. But God says in Numbers 14 and verse 9, do not rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. They're about to go into the promised land. The people of the land were giants and they were freaked out about them. And listen to what he says, for they are our bread. They're bread for us. Your enemies are bread for you. God said in Psalms 23, I can't even give you my best banquet unless you got some enemies because I prepare my best blessings in the presence of your enemies. I'll prepare a table before you. Not when you got everybody loving you, but when you're going through your darkest storms, when your heart is heavy and you feel like quitting. Listen to this. I wrote this when I didn't, I don't even know where I got it from. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe the Lord gave it to me. I don't know. 
The level of your attack will tell you two things. Number one, how valuable you are to God in your assignment. If you're going through a huge attack, it's because you have an assignment. I wish somebody had to talk. I wish I'd have listened to my own preaching. If you've got a huge assignment, it will be matched by huge attack. Secondly, the level of your attack will tell you the level of blessing that is waiting for you on the other side of this attack. I need you to shout if you made it through the fire. If you've ever made it through the flood, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Just Every voice told you you couldn't do it. Every voice told you give up. Every voice told you you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not big enough. You are crazy. But when you go through the fire and you still believe, you go through the flood and they don't overtake you, but it gets right up to your nostrils. But that's the people. You don't understand. That's the process. I don't ever talk to anybody who's done much with their life that, that they haven't had that season where it almost took them out. And I see all of these young couples and young people. If you're 40 and under, if you're 41, sorry. If you're 40 and under, stand up. 40 and under, stand up. Just, just remain standing one second. 40 and under. Well, everything that you are experiencing this morning, the people who are sitting made happen for the most part. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Most of you have been blessed by the hands of your parents or someone in your life that's, that's helped you along the way. Now, it's on you. So to dream a big dream is not to be selfish. To be highly effective in doing something with skill with your hands and build something from scratch and have a dream that you really want to, re to do something with your life, it's actually selfish to not have that kind of mentality. The reason I had you stand is I want you to feel the weight of nothing that we have done, all the things through the decades. It's because somebody heard a message like this and said, I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to be a partner with God. I'm going to do something beyond myself and help others and watch what God will do back to you. He is no man's debtor. He will come back, pressed down, shaking together, running over. You're amazing. We love you. We celebrate you. We believe in you. I believe there are dreams in this house and at every campus that, that you're standing. I believe with all of my heart, I am talking to world changers. And you may be flipping burgers or you may be Nothing wrong with that. Thank God somebody does it. It feeds us. It's not about where you are. It's where you're going and what God can trust you with. And the Bible said if you're faithful with another person's, you'll have your own. If you get up and you think about what can I get by with not doing, but when you get up and you say, I'm going to act like this is my business I work for. Every detail, I'm in it. Look out. God will put, God will paint you like they do in the military with a target. And he'll say, I'm going to watch them. And if they mean business, I'll raise them up. I'll put a dream in their heart and they'll go and they'll do and they'll make a difference, and they'll be powerful, and they'll live a life that brings glory to me. I'm proud of you. I love you. 
I, 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 I'm an older guy. I have a right to talk to you like this. Don't you dream little, little bitty dreams no more. I want you to begin to pray and say, God, I wouldn't put on this earth just to get by, live on a foot pump mentality the rest of my life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on and shout amen. Now everybody else stand with them. Raise your hand. I told you the Lord would bless you. Here comes the hand of blessing. Just lift the other hand. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. To the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. And now. The Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Say that line again. Give thanks. Say it again. Oh, I just give thanks. Has He been good to you this year? Has He? As he led you through the fire, through the flood, he's taken you to the wealthy place. On the other side. And I'm going to give you real quickly seven ingredients that we must have for our marriage to last the distance. So the first thing is faith. And then we see something else in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. He says that you are to submit. He talks about accepting God's plan for your home. And when he does that, he starts off by telling the women to submit to the husband as the head of the homes. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 says that God has placed, and I'm just the message boy, I'm just here to give you this, and, and, and this is what it says. He says, if you want to know, and listen, Listen, you can choose to ignore this. You can say that's, that's not modern enough. That's not progressive enough for the way I see it. But he says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So you must accept God's plan for the home. The second word is acceptance. What does that mean? That means you accept one another's role. And the man is the head. That does not say the man is the boss. The head of the home is not the boss of the home. Then what does it mean? What does the head of the home mean? It means you have as the man the responsibility of the home. You see, equality of worth is established in the Bible. He said we're neither male nor female in God's eyes. And he says there's no one worth more than the other. But when it comes to function, we're not the same in the function. And God said the head of the home, not the boss of the home, it, and the word head means responsibility. It does not mean you have greater privilege. 
It does not mean that you have greater privilege. It means you have greater responsibility. It means if the marriage is not working, you have greater responsibility, sir. To be the head of the home means if the family is in shambles, you have greater responsibility. It means you take responsibility. It means you have to do the best that you can do and understand the failure. Uh, if I let my family fall to pieces, it's not her fault. I have to take responsibility and I have to understand. And God says, if you, if you understand this and each one understands their role, then you can begin to have the ingredients, faith and then understanding the role that each one and acceptance of that role. A lot of fussing and fighting over this very thing. But once it begins to get in place, God can bless that home. Thirdly, there's contentment. First Peter chapter 3. It said that we're heirs together. When you study the life of Abraham and you study the life of Sarah, they had a spirit of contentment. When they started out, they were not wealthy. Now, Abraham became extremely wealthy, and Sarah became extremely wealthy. The Bible said they had very much cattle, gold, silver, and land and possessions. They were extremely wealthy later in life, but when they started out, they had nothing. They were not wealthy. They learned the secret of contentment. And that's why the Bible said they're heirs together, meaning that if you don't have this and you don't have that, Really, if you reach that point where I have my husband, I have my wife, and I have my God, and I have food, and I have clothes, and I am content, then you will begin to see the blessing of God. We're living in such a materialistic society. We live in such, under such financial pressure, and we don't understand the secret of contentment. When you can get along with God and with one another, and you, Jesus said, if you've got food and clothing, be content. If you've got more than that, I'm happy for you. If you've got just everything that money can buy, I'm happy for you. The Bible said God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. But to whom little is not enough, nothing is enough. And if you can't be happy, just you and your wife or you and your husband and God, you won't be happy when it's you and your wife in 10 homes and 10 cars and 10. It all goes back down to what really matters in life. If you have your wife, if you have your husband, if you have your God, if you've got food and clothing, you have all that you need for contentment in your life. The next thing that we see in this text, the next ingredient is forgiveness. For he goes on to say in 1 Peter 3, beginning with verse 8 through 10, be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love for one another, tenderhearted, be courteous, be loving. In other words, what he's saying is you got to be forgiving. All married people must learn to forgive, not returning evil for evil, and reviling or, 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 or just attacking, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, knowing that if you're in marriage, you're called to, 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 to not to be courteous, to not render evil for evil, to not render uh, attack for attack. You're called to this. And then he goes on to say, if you want, the next verse says, would you like to love life? Isn't that powerful? He who would love life. How many of you want to love your life? How many of you are tired of getting up and being mad? How many of you would like to get up and love life today? He said, I'm going to tell you how to do it. How many of you would like to see good days? How many of you like to see good days in your house? The Bible said in Deuteronomy that your home could be filled with days of heaven on earth. It's, that's a Bible verse that your days will be as heaven. How many of you like to see good days? And how many of you like to love your life? 
He said, then let them refrain, and this is all in context, with don't, re don't give them as good as they send you, don't forget, be courteous, be kind, be forgiving, love one another. He said, and refrain your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile, the King James says. All married people must learn to forgive. All married people must practice forgiveness. And you know the number one thing that destroys homes, literal physical homes, is not tornadoes, is not earthquakes, it's termites. The number one destroyer, little bitty things that you let crawl into your house and those little things team up and little things, that bitterness, that unwillingness to forgive, that spirit that carries a grudge, that spirit not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but counterwise blessing. So there are three levels that you can live life on. The first level is the hellish level. And the hellish level is when you give back evil for good. That somebody's being good to you and doing good to you and trying to do good to you and you turn around with a bitter, angry spirit and rail at them. And they, they, you're doing, they're doing good and you're doing evil. That's the hellish level. And then there's the human level. The human level is, well, if you're good to me, then I'll be good to you. If you're kind to me, then I'll be kind to you. If you're loving to me, then I'll be loving to you. That's human level love. I'll give you what you give me. If you hurt me, I'll hurt you. That's really how human level functions. I do to you what you do to me. Hellish level says I do good to you if you do evil to me. But heavenly level says I will do and give you back good for evil. Not railing for railing, not attack for attack, but good for evil. Listen to me. And sometimes the wife has to practice it. And sometimes the husband has to be the one who this time I'm going to give good from evil. And we cannot allow ourselves to not function in forgiveness. Forgiveness is so important. And the longer we allow those termites to come up through the floor and eat away at our homes and destroy because of bitterness and unforgiveness. The fifth thing, I'm almost done. The fifth thing we see in this text is communication. He says, he that loves life, as I said, will refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Abraham and Sarah were so different. The Lord spoke to me and said, Jensen and Sharice are so different. So different. But Proverbs 18 and 21 says, you've got to learn to communicate. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. And then romance. Likewise, you husbands dwell together with them, with knowledge. Dwell means to live with, sharing. Dwell means not just to be in the house, but to dwell, to live with, in sharing. The physical part of marriage. Giving honor. Listen to those words. Everybody say those words. Giving honor to the wife. Giving honor to the wife. There's nothing worse than to hear a guy put his wife down publicly and privately. Giving honor giving honor. God, help us to give honor. Give honor to your wife. Give honor, value. Show her that she is the number one human relationship in your life. Sincere compliments. Sincere compliments. No cheap jokes. Everybody needs compliments. Everybody, when Sharice tells me I look good, I feel so good. I feel whether I look good or not, I believe it if she tells me. <laughs> we need to give more compliments to one another. We need to speak more things. If you think it, speak it. If you think it, if you think they're amazing, if you notice something and you see them doing something and you think that's incredible. It's so easy to keep that to yourself, but say it. Give compliments to one another. Speak it. Use your communication skills. Keep joy and excitement and romance in your marriage. 
Call your spouse and check in with them all day. Communicate. Tell them you're on your ride home. The love mobile is coming in. <laughs> Sensitize your lips. I'll be there. Do something that speaks and verbalizes your love one for another. Do it spontaneously. Do it as often as you can. Say, I love you out loud. Let your children hear it. Let people see it. But most of all, let her know it. Let him know it. Men don't always want to be the aggressor. Men also want to know that their wife wants them and desires them. How do you fight fair? I'm almost done. Here's the last point. The last thing we see in this text is he says, make sure that you do all of these things that I've said, that your prayers be not hindered. The last thing, the last ingredient is prayer. Prayer in the marriage. Prayer in the family. Prayer in the home. Praying for one another. Agreeing. Speaking. The name of Jesus over your family. The name of Jesus over your marriage. And I, I, I know this isn't some super duper sermon this morning. But if we could just practice half of what we're preaching up here today. Our homes, we would see good days. We would see, we would have a good life. We would live a good life. We would see more contentment and peace and joy and moments that really is all we have when it's all said and done.